The grace of God, our Savior, hath appeared to all men, instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly and justly and godly in this world, looking for the blessed hope and coming of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Words taken from the lesson today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There's a lot of truth to this little rhyme. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw mud. The other saw stars. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw mud. And the other saw stars. Although we may not be looking through prison bars with our human eyes, we are nonetheless in some way imprisoned in this life. We're not totally and completely free to do anything we want. There are limits to our freedom. To avoid being imprisoned in the jail of the city or the state, we must abide by the civil law. To avoid being jailed in the eternal prison of fire and misery, speaking of hell, we must follow the natural law embedded in God's creation, written on our hearts, as well as the law laid down by God and His Holy Church. Unfortunately, some look upon these restrictions, these limits, these boundaries, with sorrow and even disdain. Such men are earthbound and gloomy and noticing the bars of our prison, seeing only the mud. I want to be free. I want to do my thing. Is this the kind of companion we want for our time in this world? Such people are always wanting to break free from the constraints laid down by our Creator and our Savior. And what do they want to do? They want to wallow in the mire of sin. Oh, how important it is to have good friends, good companions in this life to help us look up at the stars, even to become a star ourselves and to know them, to know them even in this life. And that is the same as knowing the saints, for that is what they are. The church tells us, the scriptures tell us, the stars in the scriptures are saints. Now here's a good resolution for the new year to be always reading a life of a saint. They make the best companions for our time of confinement because they saw the stars when they were in this life and they understood their freedom as sons of God, the freedom of heaven on the other side. They understood. They longed for that freedom to be with God. and They did what was required. Thus, the teaching of St. Paul in the lesson this morning, that we should shun ungodliness and worldly desires. We should live soberly and justly and godly in this world, looking for the blessed hope in the coming of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, to see this more clearly, and to prepare ourselves for the new year of our Lord and Savior 2015, to avoid looking at the mud we're prone to do, Let's reflect on an example from the lives of the saints. In February 1535, the English Parliament had passed the Treason Act. It stipulated a charge of high treason to be brought against anyone who denied or even refused to acknowledge that the King of England was supreme head on earth of the church in England. Now there's a problem here. An earthly king is making himself a rival to Christ's vicar, the Pope. An earthly king has inserted himself into the sanctuary of God. Such acts as this one have the smell of the Antichrist about them. Our Lord, the King of Kings, said to St. Peter, He who receives you receives me and him who sent me. He who rejects you rejects me and him who sent me. King Henry rejected Peter, the Pope, and consequently, he also rejected the King of Kings. Henry was Herod come back again. And it was all over a marriage problem. Imagine that. 
Some things never change. Commissioners were sent to all the religious houses, including the London Charter House, the Carthusians, to secure acknowledgement of the king's supremacy. The prior of the Carthusians, St. John Houghton, had set aside three days of preparation to decide how they were to respond to the commissioners. On the first day, all made a general confession. On the second day, led by Houghton himself, everyone asked pardon of each other, of his brethren in turn, for all offenses. They humbled themselves, and on the third day, the prior sang a mass of the Holy Ghost for guidance. Now on the third day, when the moment came for the elevation of the sacred host, all felt in their hearts the breath of the Holy Ghost whose counsel they had implored. To some it seemed even sensible as like a gust of wind or like a harmonious echo. The prior himself was for some minutes unable to continue the Mass. And at the subsequent chapter, he spoke of his experience with great thankfulness, but with also an exhortation that all should abide in God's grace with prayer, being humble and fearful. His own constant prayer was that of Christ's first disciples, Holy Father, keep them whom thou hast given me in thy name. Now, what was the result of this effort? It's three days. Well, the Carthusians, to a man, determined not to take the oath. They were tried at the end of April, condemned for high treason, and sentenced to death. At least the leaders were tried at the beginning. They died, 18 in all, either of the appalling death of being drawn and quartered, or else they were chained to a stake and left to starve to death in the Tower of London. St. John Houghton, the first to die, bore the agony of the butchery with heroic patience. Prolonged and aggravated by the tough hair shirt he was wearing, Conscious to the end, he died invoking the Lord he had loved and followed to the cross. He was 48 years old. These Carthusian martyrs were among the first to die in England. They had been executed as a public spectacle. Since this publicity had not worked against them as was planned, the second group had been dispatched without advertisement. The third and most numerous of the 18 was denied even the dignity of a formal trial and execution. In religion, they had asked to live as hidden servants of his majesty, the king of kings. They died silent witnesses to his words, hidden from the eyes of all, chained without possibility of movement in a foul dungeon and systematically starved to death. Yet they never lost their focus on the stars on the other side of the prison bars. They went straight to heaven. And as we know, the story is not over yet. That was 1535. This is 2015. And let's face it, there's the smell of Antichrist in the air. Marriage is still under attack. And we're still working out our salvation can we be sure that there's not some future trial like what happened to St. John Houghton and company for us? It'd be foolish to think there's not. You never know. We must be prepared for anything. So from saints such as these, we can glean what to do for the new year. Let's have five possibilities for the five wounds of Christ. So five things we can glean from these wonderful saints. First, we should recall how they all went to confession. Still more, they made a general confession. That's where you confess all the sins of your whole life, all that you can remember, the best of your ability. If you have not made one of these, we should do so at least once in our lives. This is a good time to do it. it keeps us focused on the stars, and it's been recommended by the saints themselves. St. Saint Alphonsus of Gori, St. Vincent de Paul, all the missionary saints taught it. It's a good idea. Make a good confession, especially a gentle confession. That'd be a good thing to do. Second, these good men all humbled themselves to each other, not just to God in confession. 
or in their rooms in prayer or in the chapel at church. We can humble ourselves before our fellow men when we're wrong or mistaken about something instead of acting like nothing happened as we want to do. We can also humble ourselves by doing those little tasks that we think that are beneath us. We can humble ourselves. Something we can do. That's what these saints did. They went to confession. They humbled themselves. Third of all, they went to Mass where they received special graces. We're very fortunate. We can go to Mass whenever we want. Can you not go to Mass at least one extra day a week? Is that so hard? Today's a holy day of obligation. We have to go today. Why not go an extra day every week? If you can. Fourth, they were mortified. Carthusians were very mortified. The rules of fasting and silence were kept in their strictness. They bore the cold of night without putting extra logs on the fire. They sang long hours in night choirs. This voluntary penance greatly helped them to embrace the involuntary penances imposed on them by the king when it came. So in order to prepare ourselves for a future trial, we voluntarily do some penance now so that when that involuntary thing comes, we're ready. Now, Our Lady has asked us many times that we do penance, penance, penance. Some kind of cower at that. But our Lord came and spoke to Sister Lucy on more than one occasion that what He meant by this penance, 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 was that we fulfill the duties of our state in life. When you know your duties and you fulfill them, that's doing penance. For this year, let us resolve to map out our duties. How many of us here really know our duties? I dare say hardly any of us really know all our duties very well. What's the duties I have toward God? What's the duties I have toward my spouse? What's the duties I have toward my children? What are my duties toward my parents? Can you name them? We should know them. As a priest, they have whole books written on our duties. We have to constantly be reading them because there's a lot of duties. You've got to do them right. We should become familiar with them this year so that we can fulfill them to perfection. If we do that, that's good penance. And then finally, number five, they prayed with sincerity and were very reverent at the Holy Mass. And they were known for it too. It was commonly said that if anyone wished to hear the Mass carried out with great reverence, he should visit the London Charter House. Let us seek to improve our reverence at Holy Mass and at prayer. Some examples we could think of, not talking in church, or allowing our children to roam about in the house of prayer where people are supposed to be talking to God and not distracted with each other. Furthermore, we should not get up and leave Holy Mass for any reason. Visiting the restroom ahead of time is also very helpful. If we only knew where we were at Mass, we would die. Maybe some of fright, but mostly of love. We would die if we knew where we were. Here we get up and think nothing about it. How many people go to some theater, some other place, they don't get up, go to Mass, ah, I got to go to the bathroom. And at home, we should strive not to rush our daily rosary as if it were something to get over with. Instead, we should look at it as a way to keep our eyes focused on the stars. Once again, at home, we do all these other things we take our time with. Time for the rosary. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord, please bless you. Fast as we can rip through it. Is that right? Absolutely not. Let's improve our reverence this year. There's five things we can do. We could go to confession, maybe a gentle confession. That'd be best. We can humble ourselves. We can go to Mass at least one extra time a week, if possible. We can mortify ourselves and do penance by doing our duties of our state in life to perfection, by mapping them out 
And finally, we can pray with reverence. The result of such efforts are plain to see in the life of the saints. Great patience and perseverance in trials, as we saw with these Carthusians. Fidelity, martyrdom, unity, union with Christ's mystical body, the Roman Catholic Church on earth. Come what may. Union with each other, union with God in heaven, eternal life. Men such as these Carthusians became, as it were, stars. No, even more, a constellation in the heavens above. By reading and looking into the lives of the saints, we're studying the stars and longing to be with them. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw mud and the other saw stars. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.